Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In this video, I'm going to watch an interview with uh, Shadi Hamdi, who I guess is a journalist or political commentator, editor of, a, of an online journal and so on. Uh, he's being interviewed on the Thinking Muslim YouTube channel, and the topic is Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman. This may be a long video because I'm going to actually go through it. This, it's an hour and a half interview, and I'm going to go through the whole thing and respond to, to various points, inshallah. Okay, so in the first few minutes, uh, he's talking about sort of the domestic political situation in Saudi Arabia that bin Salman uh, inherited, and how to consolidate his power as the crown prince and de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. I think this is more or less accurate. He talks about uh, bin Salman needing to implement certain economic policies that may be unwelcome by the Saudi population. I'm not sure if that's accurate. The question is in the context of allowing uh, certain entertainment activities in Saudi Arabia that Muslims worldwide find offensive, uh, raves in the desert and uh, concerts and whatnot, saying that this is a sort of a trade-off where bin Salman is telling the Saudi population, I'm going to have to do policies uh, domestically that you may dislike, but on the upside, you'll get to watch uh, Beyonce, giving people, you know, opportunities to, to dance and have fun and whatnot. Uh, can distract them and depoliticize them. That's that's a general policy that, that governments would take. That's more or less accurate, but I don't know if it's specifically because he wants to stifle criticism or opposition to particular policies. I think he would just like to be left alone uh, to rule the country the way he sees fit, and he would like the people, the population, to be distracted with other things. Okay, there's a couple of things here. He says that uh, one of the reasons that Ben Salman is providing these entertainment activities for the population is because he's afraid of a backlash. He's afraid of a backlash from the population against the policies that he needs to implement, that Shadi believes he needs to implement. And he mentions the Arab Spring. The idea being that there might be a kind of an Islamist backlash against the policies, or anyway, a popular backlash against the policies. Uh, but then he says that bin Salman is part of the MBC generation, in other words, the generation that was influenced by the uh, broadcasting of Western films and uh, television programs on the cable channel. And if bin Salman is from the MBC generation and is highly influenced by MBC, then so is the population of Saudi Arabia. If they are inclined towards the same things that uh, MBS is inclined towards, then I'm not sure what would be the basis for a backlash. If Mohammed bin Salman is part of the um, MBC generation, well, so are most of the Saudis. So they would be on the same page with regards to what they want to see happen in Saudi Arabia. Then he goes on to talk about that this is, again, some, some sort of a trade-off, uh, whereby bin Salman is saying, I will give you, you know, these activities, these frivolities, uh, and you will agree to not want civil engagement, to not want to have a voice in policy, to not want to have a voice in the government, and, stuff, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, when did the population have civil engagement in Saudi Arabia? Is this a new phenomenon that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is introducing to Saudi Arabia that was previously uh, democratic with a dynamic civil society that uh, had a lot of say in policy making? No, this is nothing new. So I don't, I don't think that this trade-off is even necessary. I think he's closer to the truth in saying that MBS and the majority of the population in Saudi Arabia are what he refers to as the MBC generation. In other words, they are less inclined towards the rigid Wahhabi Salafi uh, madhab and the imposition of a uh, very strict interpretation of Islam uh, that the previous regimes in Saudi Arabia have uh, imposed. So I think bin Salman and the population are more likely on the same page uh, in this regard. And it's not so much that he's sort of bribing the population to not be political, I think that they generally wouldn't be anyway. Because what what's their heritage of political activism? It's not much. The jailing of sheikhs, the jailing of scholars, the jailing of khatibs, uh, the jailing of activists is not an innovation by uh, Mohammed bin Salman. This is something that we've always seen in Saudi Arabia and in the Emirates and in the Arab world and on earth. I don't think it's fair to attribute this 
uh, as some sort of unique quality of uh, Mohammed bin Salman's regime. He's talking about the fact that um, people who are criticizing uh, bin Salman sponsoring these entertainment activities, uh, people who criticize that also criticize the very rigid interpretation of Islam that uh, Saudi Arabia has imposed for the last several decades. So that weakens their ability to criticize bin Salman because after all, you also don't agree with this very rigid Wahhabism, uh, Salafism, whatever you want to call it. Now I'm doing the other thing. I'm doing something else. I'm opening it up to other more liberal uh, types of activities and you're criticizing that. Do you, are you therefore advocating this very radical uh, and rigid Salafism? that you yourself have criticized okay that's that's a valid point but also it's it, it's actually a valid point bin salman by what he's doing because again if we're talking about the mbc generation the, the population is tired of this very rigid uh, interpretation of islam bin salman is tired of this very rigid interpretation of islam and he views it as holding the country back and holding the population back. And I think he has a point. This is, uh, in my view, in my opinion, this is his thinking. He has to do something to conclusively, to decisively castrate the power of the religious institutions that enforce this very rigid interpretation of Islam. So he has a concert. So he has a rave. So he opens it up to these types of activities to show you don't have power anymore. And I don't see that that would cause a backlash among a population whom he's describing as the NBC generation. I see this as uh, Mohammed bin Salman reading the room and understanding that his people uh, are tired of this rigid interpretation of Islam. Uh, whatever you may think about it, the population has been living with it for decades and they're tired of having a mutawa come to them with a big beard and, and telling them that they are uh, fasiq and that they're you know, committing shirk or something because of the length of their trousers and so on. And we all know from our own life experience and our own interactions with people who are indoctrinated through that system of very rigid Wahhabism that it creates human bots. It creates people who cannot process information properly, who can't process information correctly, who can't think critically, who can't be objective in uh, the way they interact with the world, who are highly, highly ideological, rigid in their thinking, robotic in their understanding of things. And they, they, they operate like a kind of um, cheap AI where there's just sort of pattern recognition. They see certain things, they hear certain words, there are certain red flags for them, and then they just jump to this isn't Islam, this isn't true Islam, this isn't proper, this is yours, your aqidah is wrong, and so on and so on and so on. They have an extremely narrow understanding of the religion, and that narrow understanding often translates into a very narrow understanding of the world because you have become accustomed to viewing the world in very simplistic terms. And you have become accustomed to not thinking for yourself. You've, you've become accustomed to being spoon-fed what to believe, what to think. Uh, and very often, what you are being spoon-fed to think and believe is incredibly simplistic. And there's no room for complexity or nuance. There's no room for it. And then you go out into the world and you approach the world with the same mindset. And obviously, that's, that's going to be holding you back as a population, as an individual, and as a nation. So I think that bin Salman uh, has identified, I need to decisively restrict the power and influence of these institutions and this ideology. And he's doing it in a rather dramatic and, we can agree, relatively distasteful way. But there's, but, but there's a method to it. There's a reason for it. It's because it has to be a decisive and conclusive emasculation of the power of these institutions. Okay, now he's making the point that uh, in a country like Tunisia, they really, really crack down on Islam and on religious influence in Tunisia. And then when they had the Arab Spring, uh, in the first election, Islamist parties did the best in the elections. 
but at the same time, he's suggesting that what bin Salman is doing uh, is endangering the religion among the population, and that the people are in danger of you know, being misguided and becoming deviant and uh, becoming irreligious and so on. But he's contradicting that by talking about how that doesn't work. The people, it turns out, Muslims don't need to have the religion imposed upon them. They don't need to have the government enforce religion upon them. They are religious because they believe in Allah. They're religious because they are Muslims and being Muslim matters to them. So he's making, he, he's, he's contradicting his own argument that bin Salman is endangering religion in Saudi Arabia while pointing to the fact that when the government in Tunisia cracked down on Islamic uh, influences in the society, it had no impact on the sentiments of the population. And it would be the same in Saudi Arabia as it would be anywhere else because Muslims are not religious because it is enforced by the government. It's enforced by their heart. It's enforced by their conscience. It's enforced by their iman. And iman can't be legislated by the government or enforced by the government. So I'd be wary to the say that the youth are celebrating it. I think there are a lot of people perhaps who are going to these parties and the raves and the like. But I think there are more people in Saudi who are very worried, very uncomfortable with what is taking place. And the proof is that Bin Salman believes that to implement them, he needs to imprison people. To implement them, he must crack down on the population. Okay, this is a bit dishonest in my opinion. He's not cracking down on the population, he's cracking down on dissent, which is not new. And again, he's sort of contradicting what he said earlier in that we're talking about, as he said, the MBC generation and saying that they're not necessarily on board with what bin Salman is doing, but if they're the MBC generation, then they would be. And also, he's pointing to Tunisia, uh, where having beaches and having parties and having raves and having um, concerts did not dampen the religious sentiment of the population. So where exactly is the danger here? His position is a bit muddled here, I think, because he's arguing that cracking down on religious authorities and religious influence doesn't change the religious sentiments of the population. And he's also arguing that in Saudi Arabia, opening up uh, entertainment opportunities and activities and so on doesn't change the religious sentiment of the population. So what's the danger? Bin Salman is jailing people because he's afraid of a backlash, not from the population. He's afraid of a backlash from the religious authorities, from the religious institutions, from precisely that segment in Saudi Arabia whom he is trying to restrict in their influence. Not the population. The population, if, if what he said earlier is to be believed, are the MBC generation who are fed up from the, the, the rigid, gruff, harsh... Uh, Mutawa, who was telling them, do this, do that, and so on. He, he gave a quote once to the Los Angeles Times in which he said, the Saudis are voting with their feet, suggesting they're going to, the, to these raves and their parties. If that was the case, the, the prisons would not be full. And I think that is one of the greatest indications to suggest. The, <laughs> the prisons aren't full of people who didn't want to go to a rave. That's not what the prisons are full of in Saudi Arabia. The prisons aren't full of people who didn't want to go see Mariah Carey. The prisons are full of people who are criticizing bin Salman and accusing him of being uh, too liberal or being too Western or of de-Islamizing uh, Saudi Arabia. That's who is being persecuted in Saudi Arabia. The people who represent the vested interests of the Wahhabi, Salafi, religious institutions and authorities whom bin Salman is trying to restrict in their influence. No government even if they call themselves democratic, no government wants the participation of the population in policymaking, period. Nobody wants that, in who's in power. Everybody in power wants to do things on their own, and they want the population to sit down and shut up. And in the Arab world, especially in the Khalij, the rulers have a very paternalistic uh, approach to governance, whereby they see themselves as the father of their country. They see themselves as the father and the population is the children. And father knows best. You're not supposed to talk. You're not supposed to question dad. You're not supposed to, uh, you know, be a backseat driver. And you're just supposed to listen and trust that your father knows what's best for you. And he's implementing policies that are for your best interests. That's the way the rulers in the Khalij think. That's the way they have always thought. 
Uh, that's the way previous regimes in Saudi Arabia thought. Uh, that's the way Ben Zayed thinks in UAE. That's the way Mohammed bin Rashid thinks in Dubai. That's the way the ruler in Qatar thinks in Kuwait and so on and so on and so on. They all think that way. And if you are critical, you will be shut down. It doesn't matter. This, again, isn't something new to Mohammed bin Salman. And it's a bit disingenuous to pretend that it is. And it's a bit disingenuous to say that the only way that he can impose concerts on Saudi Arabia is by throwing people in jail and, and, and in other words, like threatening them as if, if you don't go see Mariah Carey, we're going to put you in jail. Obviously, that's not what's happening. If you say that it's haram for me to do what I'm doing and taqillah and fear Allah and you shouldn't do this and uh, your, your regime is invalid because of what you're doing, yeah, you're going to go to jail. And that is the same thing that would have happened in the past. See, and the truth is that the rigid form of Wahhabism, Salafism, again, whatever you want to call it, this rigid interpretation of Islam, that had to be enforced by throwing people in jail. And no tolerance for dissent, no tolerance for alternative opinions, that had to be enforced for decades by severe and harsh persecution in Saudi Arabia. Uh, having concerts does not have to be enforced by imprisonment and persecution. The host brings up a question now at around 20 minutes as to whether or not uh, bin Salman is doing this to placate the West. Okay, I'm not sure what he's going to say, but I will tell you, the West absolutely supported strict Madhali Wahhabism. Absolutely loves it. It keeps the population busy with checking the, si the, the, the length of people's trousers, the length of people's beards, how much of the woman's face is showing. Uh, and they're completely depoliticized. There was no ideology Islamically in the Muslim world that was less political, that was more anti-political than the Wahhabism that was enforced by Saudi Arabia for the last several decades. And America loved it. America has been supportive of Saudi Arabia for all these years and supportive of Wahhabism, supportive of Salafism because it was incredibly useful uh, for the United States. It was the basis for uh, sowing division in the Muslim world. It was the basis for sowing extremism in the Muslim world. It was the basis for creating extremist, militant, radical groups in the Muslim world, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, Daesh, and so on. It was the basis for uh, fueling uh, militancy and uh, jihadi ideology in Syria and elsewhere, all of which is useful for destabilization and disruption by the United States. They do not want to see uh, Wahhabism, Salafism, this very strict anti-political ideology uh, wane in Saudi Arabia. So if you think that uh, bin Salman is doing this to placate the West, it's the opposite. This is the last thing that the West wants to see in Saudi Arabia. No crown prince or king has ever said to an American official, we need to reign in Islam in Saudi Arabia. Okay. First of all, he just he just gave the quote that bin Salman is supposed to have said to some American official. And then he mischaracterizes the quote. Bin Salman said, I need your support, I need your help, and I need time to counteract the radical extremist ideologies in Saudi Arabia. Now, he is characterizing that as bin Salman saying, we need to reign in Islam in Saudi Arabia. It's not Islam. It's a very specific, dogmatic, intolerant, inflexible, rigid interpretation of Islam that bin Salman is trying to rein in. Now he is disingenuously uh, saying that it is Islam itself. That's not what's happening at all. If anything, bin Salman is trying to bring Saudi Arabia in line with the rest of the Muslim world with regards to their approach to Islam. Because Wahhabism, Salafism, this very, very strict form of Salafism, uh, is completely out of step with the rest of the Ummah. And it's completely out of step with the history of Islamic scholarship and understanding of the religion. And this is what bin Salman was talking about. And now this guy is characterizing it as Islam itself. Although he clearly is not a Salafi Wahhabi. He's, if anything, he's Ikhwani. He's, he, he looks like Ikhwan. He talks like Ikhwan. 
he's clearly leaning towards Ikhwan, whether he is actually a member of the Ikhwan or not, but he clearly leans in that direction. They don't believe that the Saudi previous version of Islam is the correct version of Islam. So don't, don't now say that this very dogmatic and very specific uh, Najdi interpretation of Islam by Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab is the interpretation of Islam. You don't even believe that yourself. At, tw at 21 minutes, 41 seconds, he says, I don't think that the Americans asked bin Salman to do this. Yeah, no kidding. Of course not. That's the last thing they want to see happen. They don't want to see Saudi Arabia become less radical. They need radicals. For the last 20 years, they've been in the radical manufacturing business in America, for American foreign policy, has been the radical extremist militant manufacturing business. One of their main ideological factories has been Saudi Arabia. They don't want to see it become de-radicalized, not at all. These Arabs, they don't know how to vote. Bin Zayezayed says, according to the New York Times article, that if a man stood up in Mecca today and said, I am the Mahdi or I am going to deliver Islam, Bin Zayed said 80% of my army would go and join this man in Mecca. Okay, now, if Muhammad Bin Zayed did say that, and he genuinely believes that to be true about his own army, is that not a legitimate concern? Isn't that a legitimate concern? That any, any person can stand up in Mecca and say, I'm the Mahdi? And 80% of the army will go and support him? Is that okay? Is that fine? Don't you think that that is an ideological indoctrination that needs to be countered? Don't you think that the people who would go along with something like that need to be better educated, need to have better critical thinking skills, need to have a better grasp of what the religion actually says and what the religion actually is? Or do you think that's fine? When Ben Zayed said that the Arabs don't know how to vote, I don't disagree with him. Why would they? They haven't experienced democracy for decades. Why would they know how to vote? They will support anyone who they think who they see praying. Because yes, the, 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 the Muslims do care about Islam. They do care about the religion. So yeah, if they see, like a Muhammad Mursi, for example, making salah, they'll think, yeah, this is a great guy. It doesn't matter if he has no clue about policy. It doesn't matter. Yes, it's true. Giving free and fair elections, so-called, to a population to an electorate that is that ignorant about policy and that is that emotional in their connection to Islam, that is dangerous. Of course that's dangerous. You will get elected people who have no idea what they're doing. I think Bin Salman, when he vision 2030, it's from his own belief first before it's about winning over the West. You mentioned vision. Okay, he's correct. These reforms are not being dictated by the West. He's correct about that. I don't think, however, that he's correct in saying that this is a liberal elite who is forcing these reforms on the population against their will um, and who supported the coups and so on. Look, the coup in Egypt was a disaster. Absolutely. Uh, Sisi is a disaster. Absolutely. But Mohamed Morsi was a disaster also. The election of Mohamed Morsi was a disaster also. Let's be honest. Mohamed Morsi had no clue how to govern Egypt. He had no clue about policy. He had no idea. One of the first things that Mohamed Morsi did when he was elected was to reach out to the IMF and to start negotiations with the IMF. That's one of the first things he did. He didn't have any principled uh, objection to the IMF neoliberal program. No principled objection, no moral objection, no economic objection. He hesitated to implement IMF reforms because he was afraid of a backlash. Okay. By saying that to the IMF, which he said, he was inadvertently recommending the army uh, for the government because the army doesn't have to worry about backlash because the people with guns don't have to worry about a backlash. So who is the IMF, uh, the West? Who are they going to prefer? The Muslim Brotherhood who are incompetent at governing and who cannot handle uh, a backlash, who, who don't have sufficient control over the military to ensure that they can uh, crack down on a backlash? Or are you going to trust that job to Abdul al-Fatah Hassisi, who can bring out the big guns and make sure that the, the neoliberal program is implemented without any significant uh, disruption. People voted for Mohamed Mursi because yes, they have an Islamic sentiment, because they're emotionally Muslim. 
one of the first things he did was to reach out to the IMF. And within weeks or within months of his election, they were filling the tunnels in Gaza with waste material from septic tanks. This is your guy. This is your your leader with taqwa because you saw him praying in the uh, presidential palace. And he's filling the tunnels in Gaza, between Egypt and Gaza, with waste. And he's telling the IMF, I will do what you want me to do, but I'm scared of the people. That's, that's what happens when you have the electorate who will vote for anyone who says that they're Muslim and has the banner of Islam and says Islam is the solution and so on. That's what you get. You get someone who is completely incompetent and who is acquiescent and, and, and obsequious towards the West and who has no idea how to implement policies, has no idea how to govern and doesn't have the ability to even control his own army. So the West, the UAE and Saudi Arabia and the IMF threw their support behind the coup. You have to understand how these things actually happened and why. Because yes, the coup is a disaster, but Mohammed Morsi was a disaster. Rahimahullah. But is the wrong guy for the job. And the people who have the ability to uh, place the right guy for the job did it. That's all. That to enable the economic innovation, we need to remove the chains of the religious thought. But how do they explain that? Because there doesn't seem to be a connection. Between oh, there's a very clear and obvious connection. And he's not wrong. Like I said, the, the very strict and rigid uh, Wahhabism stunts thought. It stunts the ability to think properly. Now, I'm not saying something against uh, Salafism blanket. There's a contingent of incredibly uh, intelligent, educated, uh, nuanced thinkers within the Salafis. However, they are not representative of Salafism and Wahhabism generally. And what the that Wahhabi Salafi education does to a person's brain is to turn it into a kind of a cheap AI, really. So there absolutely is a connection between removing the chains of the religion, and by the religion here, it is not the religion, it's the very dogmatic and rigid version and interpretation of the religion that Saudi Arabia has been implementing for and imposing and enforcing for decades. That does need to be reined in. There's no question about that. It is damaging to the ability of people to think properly. He has to be able to rein in the influence of the uh, Salafi Wahhabi religious institutions who can otherwise disrupt his plans because they have a completely different set of priorities than him. He has to deal with reality. He has to deal with like what he's talking about, diversifying the economy. And you have to do what you have to do to diversify the economy if you want to be sustainable. That's absolutely realistic. And he can't be forced to also appease and placate uh, dogmatic religious authorities in his own country. So uh, there's, there's an obvious connection. In fact, there's no way to disconnect them. If you want to develop Saudi Arabia economically, you must rein in the influence of these rigid, dogmatic religious authorities. No question about it. And you have to reform your education system so that people can develop actual critical thinking skills and an actual uh, more flexible and more comprehensive and thorough understanding of the religion. To appreciate the 1400 years of scholarship that isn't as simplistic as, oh, this is haram, this is halal, it's all clear cut, it's black and white. This is not the way anybody sees it who, who has a mind. But if you, if you come through an education system that, that cultivates that way of thinking, and like I said, you will use that way of thinking throughout all other areas of life, which will set you behind other people who can actually think properly. And the hours that the children spend on Quran and Islamic studies in schools is to be significantly reduced. And in its place, we will introduce subjects of critical thinking. I know it's ironic, given that anybody who speaks on Twitter is put in prison. But the point here being is that the, the correlation Vincent Mann makes is clear. Too much religion is hampering critical thinking with regards to the development of the economy. No. Not too much religion. 
too much dogma and that specific interpretation of religion. That's what he is uh, seeing as hampering critical thought and intellectual development in Saudi Arabia and hence economic development in Saudi Arabia. And he's not wrong. And I think part of that is that when you ask the West to explain their enlightenment, to explain how they became the superpower that they are, they will always bring it back to their bitter war with the church. That when they defeated the church, when they removed its influence, we had free thinking and we became a dominant economy. Bin Salman is importing a history that is alien from the region. No, that's not it at all. I mean, the West is the West and they have their own problems and they have their own reasons for why they did what they did. That has nothing to do with what uh, Bin Salman is doing. He has correctly identified, in my opinion, he has correctly identified the very strict, very rigid Wahhabi way of thinking and ideology and indoctrination in Saudi Arabia as harmful to the intellectual development and growth of his people. And he is correct. That is not the same thing at all. In fact, in some, in some ways, it's the opposite of saying that he is trying to restrict or limit religion. Because that particular interpretation of the religion is extremely limiting. That interpretation of the religion is very narrow and it blocks out huge oceans of knowledge uh, in Islam that you will only be able to pursue if you have broken free from that indoctrination. So. This does not, in my view, what he's talking about anyway, the specific examples that he's talking about, reduce uh, the time spent on Qur'an recitation and learning Qur'an and increase the amount of time spent on critical thinking. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever, in my opinion. Because again, this is just putting Saudi Arabia more in line with the rest of the Muslim world. And all of us are Muslims. Are you, are you arguing that the Saudis are better Muslims than the rest of us? Are you arguing that their particular interpretation of Islam, the Wahhabi interpretation of Islam, is more correct than everybody else? I mean, this is, this is what is being implied by this argument. Because you have religious education in Malaysia, you have religious education in Indonesia, you have religious education in Turkey, you have religious education in Egypt, you have religious education throughout the Muslim world. Just giving them the chance to learn some other things, what is wrong with that? It's just bringing them in line with the rest of the Ummah. Because as Ibn Khaldun said, that the, the conquered always wants to follow the conqueror's way. That the dominant powers, Bin Salman wants to be like the US in terms of its power and prosperity. So I should follow something very similar to them. So Vision 2030 in the cultural social... No, see, this isn't following... This isn't trying to imitate the West or be like the West. This isn't uh, Bin Salman trying to imitate the West. This isn't Bin Salman trying to be like them. This isn't the conquered imitating the conqueror or trying to follow the ways of the conqueror. This is closer to what the Muslims have always been. If anything, he's trying to emulate the Islamic empires of the past, the Islamic governments of the past, the Islamic states of the past, not uh, America. Why would you think that? That's a very biased uh, take, in my opinion, that he knows will appeal to Muslim audiences, even though it's a kind of a cognitive dissonance because if you're a Muslim and you come from the Muslim world, you know that where you grew up, it wasn't like that. You know that where you grew up, you learned other things too. And you're Muslim and you care about the deen and you practice the deen and you also pursue other things in your life. And you try and your nation tries to develop economically. Why is there a different standard for Saudi Arabia? And why are you pretending now that the strict Wahhabi version of Islam is the correct version of Islam when you don't follow it yourself and nobody else in the world agrees with that? Mohammed bin Salman announces a series of measures where he says that loudspeakers must be reduced to 33% on the volume for the call to prayer and they are banned for Quran and khutbah. Some people might think, okay, loudspeakers might be annoying. How many revert stories have you heard of people walking down the street in a Muslim country hearing the Quran on the loudspeaker and saying that it moved me to the extent that I entered the mosque and then they became Muslim? That's the first thing. Second point is... Okay. <laughs> He's arguing that Bin Salman <clears throat> uh, commanding that the volume of the loudspeakers for the Adhan and for the Qur'an should be reduced uh, to 30, 33%, that this somehow will prevent non-Muslims from walking in the street and hearing it 
and being moved in their heart and coming <clears throat> and coming to the masjid and becoming Muslim. This presupposes the presence of non-Muslims walking in the streets in Saudi Arabia. But when bin Salman implements policies to try to uh, facilitate non-Muslims coming to Saudi Arabia, he gets criticized for that too. So do you want them to be in the streets so that they can hear the Qur'an? Or do you want the Qur'an to play at full volume to a street full of Muslims who have already heard it and are already Muslim and are not going to revert? In order for someone to revert to Islam, they have, they have to be non-Muslims present to hear it. But when he brings non-Muslims, he's criticized for that. Look, as much as all of us despise the libertine aspects of Dubai, between four and 5,000 people convert to Islam in Dubai every year. Those are people who came to Dubai as non-Muslims, most likely because of the libertine aspects of Dubai that we despise. They came there for that, and they left as Muslims. So do you want to bring them and expose them to Qur'an and expose them to Islam or not? Or you just want to expose Muslims to Islam and Qur'an? You know, it's not as black and white as we would like it to be or as we, we tend to think about it. This is a very disingenuous criticism in my view. You're mad at him for reducing the volume because then non-Muslims won't hear it and they won't convert to Islam because their hearts are moved by it. But also, they won't be there anyway. So... <laughs> Why would you reduce the loudspeaker of the volume when you're amplifying the volume of the giant raves and the nightclubs? Okay, see, so now he's losing me. Are they amplifying it? Are they are they putting loudspeakers throughout all of Jeddah, throughout Makkah and Medina, saying, everybody listen to Mariah Carey? Come on now. This is unhinged. And this is a problem. This reveals, actually, why mild criticism in a tweet gets harshly repressed. Because the intelligence services and bin Salman and the government can recognize that mild criticism is covering radical criticism. Because look, this brother begins the interview pretty much objective. Reasonable, objective, uh, more or less fair in his assessment of what bin Salman is doing and what his position is and what his strategy is and so on. And then he veers off into these accusations of bin Salman is trying to imitate the West and he's trying to amplify uh, Fahisha while reducing Quran and he's trying to uh, restrict Islam and he's trying to de-Islamize Saudi Arabia and so on. This is radical unhinged criticism that began very mildly. So the Saudi authorities are going to see any tweet that appears to be a very timid uh, criticism uh, or nasiha of the government and they will understand okay what's actually beneath that is a radical criticism that is you know on the verge of being takfiri because now you're you're saying that bin salman is aggressively trying to uh, limit the influence of islam itself the religion itself while simultaneously promoting uh, fisk and fahisha. This is a radical criticism. This is not fair. Because what, what, he's, what he's allowing in Saudi Arabia is allowed in every Muslim country, except like Afghanistan. It's allowed in every Muslim country. Are we all in, in every Muslim country in the world? Are we less Muslim somehow? This is demagoguery, what he's doing now. He's not putting loudspeakers blasting Mariah Carey in the Kaaba. If you had the choice to give your money to the Imam of the mosque or to Muhammad bin Salman who tried to bring Nicki Minaj to Saudi Arabia, where would you prefer to give your money to? Okay, this brother is really losing me because his criticisms now about like the, the Ramadan rules uh, are very, very biased. I don't see anything wrong with the rules that he has mentioned and I, I certainly don't see anything unusual about the rules that he has mentioned. Now he's saying something that is just really, really uh, blatantly uh, manipulative, uh, demagogic rhetoric. Who would you rather give your charity to? To the Imam of the Masjid or to Muhammad bin Salman who wants to bring Nicki Minaj? That's not the choice. That's not what's being offered here. Who would you rather give the charity, your, your charity to, your salaqah to, your zakat to? To an unregistered 
charity that has not been checked by the government to see to ensure that the money actually goes where it's supposed to go or to a charity that has been registered and checked by the government to make sure that the money goes where it's supposed to go that's the actual question and this is again not an unusual practice this is the same thing that they have in uae and in many other countries that if you want to uh, give sadaqa you have to give sadaqa to charities that are approved by the government that part of this has to do with money laundering. Part of this has to do with terrorist financing. And this is an issue in the Gulf. You don't want to give your money to an individual or, or an organization who may misuse that money for illegal purposes or who may just eat the money. So uh, charities have to register with the government and be uh, reviewed by the government and be audited by the government. And they conclude that these are legitimate charities that are not engaged in money laundering or terrorist financing. And now you can you are approved to to give to these charities. I don't. What's the problem with that exactly? He's trying to pose it as you're giving the money to Mohammed bin Salman himself. That's not what's happening. That's a dishonest characterization of this policy. And that's the reason why in these rules you see the de-Islamization being pushed. One of the rules was. Do not bring your kids to the mosque because they disturb the worshippers. So bin Salman does a giant rave at the gates of Mecca in Jeddah. People are doing Umrah less than one hour away. He brings Pitbull and whoever in giant raves, etc. And he wants to tell you, I don't want to disturb the worshippers. Okay, see this guy, again, he's gone from being an objective analyst of what bin Salman is doing or trying to do. Uh, he's gone from that to being sort of an ideological uh, rhetorician. He's doing this, he's, he's, he's banning Qur'an, he's banning children from the masjid, and he's on the gates of Mecca, he's having a concert with Pitbull and Nicki Minaj and whoever else, and then claiming that he doesn't want to disturb the worshippers. Can you hear, when you're making Umrah, can you hear what people are doing in Jeddah at the rave? Can you hear that? This is, this is dishonest. I don't, I don't see anything that he's mentioned so far, and you can watch it yourself. I don't see anything that he's mentioned so far as unreasonable. A lot of these policies are exactly the same throughout all of the Muslim world. But he, is, he has an axe to grind. Clearly, he's got a grudge against Saudi Arabia and against uh, MBS. And I'm guessing that it's because he is inclined towards the Ikhwan. Allahu alam. But I'm guessing that it's because he has leanings towards the Muslim Brotherhood. And so he has an axe to grind against bin Salman. Um, and he keeps, he, he, he keeps referring to uh, bin Salman's effort to limit and restrict the influence of Wahhabi, Salafi, religious institutions in Saudi Arabia as de-Islamization. Which means that he subscribes to the idea that that particular dogma, that particular interpretation of Islam is the correct and only interpretation of Islam, and that if you restrict that particular interpretation, you are restricting the religion itself, which obviously he doesn't believe. He's not a Wahhabi, he's not a Salafi, that's not what he subscribes to. But for the sake of his argument, he is portraying that particular dogma as the only version of Islam, and therefore if you restrict that particular dogma, you are restricting Islam itself. In other words, it's a disingenuous argument. And it, it reveals that he just has an axe to grind. Yes, but maybe Sheikh Ramsi questioned Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Today he questioned Umar bin Abdul Aziz, a, a figure considered who is revered by Muslims everywhere. His stories are told everywhere that during his reign they couldn't even find people to give zakat to. If it's Umar bin Abdul Aziz today, tomorrow it will be Uthman bin Affan. This, again, bro, this guy is really losing me. He's, I, I, I started with some respect for his analytical skills, and then he just has gone off the rails with an emotional and clearly agenda-driven uh, set of criticisms that are increasingly outlandish. If you advocate having a historically accurate understanding and portrayal of Umar bin Abdulaziz. That is not casting doubt on him. That is clarifying who the man actually was and giving us as Muslims a proper understanding of this great man. I advocate taking that same approach 
to Uthman bin Affan. I advocate taking that same approach to Umar bin al-Khattab. I advocate taking that same approach to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I advocate taking that same approach to Ali bin Abi Talib. I, I advocate taking that same approach to all of the Sahaba. I advocate taking that approach to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't need mythology. We don't need legends. We need accurate, authentic information. And if you think that somehow the esteem that the Muslims have for the Salaf al Salih will be decreased by having accurate information about them, then this is a problem in your mind that you think we need to uh, exaggerate and make things up in order to make these people great, in order to make these people honorable, in order to make these people admirable, in order to make these people the best generations. No, they are the best generations. And if we learn accurate information about them, that's valuable to us. Much more valuable than legends that no one can relate to and no one can actually believe. Because authenticity of information has always been of primacy to this ummah and to the scholars of this ummah. We have always wanted to have accurate, authentic, valid, verified information about Islam and about the important figures in Islam and about historic events. And if we actually are going to take the position where we don't want things to be clarified, we don't want things to be authenticated, we don't want things to be uh, accurate historically, we need our legends, we need our myths. Then this is this is us going astray, Yanni. This is us going following the way of people with invented uh, religions. This is us following the way of people who just need to make up stories to believe in. These were real people. And the more we know about them that is real and accurate, the more we can benefit. Understanding that these weren't malaika, understanding that these were actual living breathing human beings they weren't demigods they weren't the stuff from the greek pantheon they were actual people and he's making it sound like saying that there are myths surrounding Umar bin abdul aziz and there are that saying that is somehow uh detracting from who Umar bin abdul aziz was and therefore if you allow defamation against Umar bin Abdul Aziz, you will allow it against uh, Uthman bin Affan. It's not defamation. It's trying to have an accurate picture of these great and admirable heroes of Islam. And I don't see anything wrong with that. The sound of the Quran on the streets of Saudi Arabia overnight disappeared except for Mecca and Medina. You could walk in Riyadh or walk in Jeddah hearing the recitation Hearing an ayah that might make you go home and reconcile with your wife. Hearing an ayah that might make you go back and feel maybe you were harsh with your son and you go speak to him differently. Okay, he's he's harping on this issue of uh, not having recitation of Quran playing on loudspeakers in the streets. My question is, is the Quran background noise? Is the Quran supposed to just be white noise in the background? Or are you supposed to listen with focus and concentration and attention when the Qur'an is being recited. Because my understanding is that when the Qur'an is recited, you're supposed to listen. You're supposed to turn your attention to that and focus on that, stop what you're doing, and pay attention to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not supposed to be something that mixes with the sounds of traffic, with the sounds of people playing music, with the sounds of people uh, chattering, and so on. You're supposed to focus on it and pay attention to it. So I'm not sure why he's now advocating uh, the importance of treating the Qur'an as background noise in the street. As if bin Salman, what he did in one night was he moved the sound of the Qur'an from all of Saudi Arabia and limited it now to Mecca and Medina as if suddenly Islam is going to become like the Vatican within a one kilometer radius. Really, he's going too far with this. Saying that, that he has... <laughs> he has moved the Qur'an and restricted the Qur'an itself to just Mecca and Medina. As if in every Saudi home, they don't listen to Quran. They don't recite Quran. In all the masajid, they recite Quran. In every home, people are listening to it in their cars. People are listening to it on their headphones. Women are listening to it as they cook. People are playing it on YouTube or whatever. In every Saudi home. And now he's pretending that if the government doesn't promote the playing of Quran on loudspeakers in the streets, then that is somehow 
uh, limiting the human being's access to the Quran. Bro, I have lived in five Muslim countries and spent time in at least that many more. And in none of these countries is the Quran playing 24-7 in the streets. But somehow people haven't lost the Quran. Somehow people are still Muslim. Somehow Islam still survives in these Muslim majority countries. Somehow people, st you still have Hafiz Quran. Somehow people still recite the Quran in their homes. Somehow people still are familiar with the Quran and remember the Quran and recite the Quran. Even somehow, without it being broadcast by loudspeakers in the streets, mixing with the traffic sounds and the sounds of the streets and so on. He's really exposing that he just has a grudge. I ask every Muslim, is this what you would be satisfied with, with regards to what bin Salman is doing in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I'm satisfied because that's the same thing that is happening in every Muslim country everywhere. And that always has been the case. Because you know what? When I want to listen to Quran, I don't go out in the street to do it. Allah has ordered every human being to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. You don't need an intercessor to tell you that you should be enjoining good and forbidding evil. In other words, that rebellion against oppression and that which is wrong is something that every single human being is capable of by virtue of what Allah has said in the Quran. That's the terrifying thing about Islam. That there is no, you don't have to wait for a priest or the like. That you can go to social media and denounce what? An authoritarian person is doing and that Islam evokes such resonance amongst the population that all it takes is for a random individual to say it and the whole population will say it with him that's what's terrifying about Islam for Muhammad bin Salman or for the authoritarianism okay there's there's so many things wrong with what he just said I'm not really sure where to start he's advocating the idea that anybody can just spout off as they like which is the thinking of the people who rose up against Uthman bin Affan. This is not Islamic thinking. It's not upon every individual to declare what is right and what is wrong. This is, again, something I've talked about before. Even if the government are oppressors, even if the government deserves Islamically, according to Sharia, to be overthrown, that process must be undertaken by the Ahl al-Hal wal aqd of the society, not the general population. Because when it's undertaken by the general population, that inevitably just becomes chaos. So even if you're talking about rising up against the government, it's not a general uprising. It is a movement by the Ahl al-Hal wal aqd in the society to unseat that government. Islam does not approve of open rebellion and open revolution, popular revolution. This is not something that we advocate or endorse or approve in Islam because it always leads to chaos. Not to mention the fact that the dogmatic version of Islam that bin Salman is restricting in Saudi Arabia is precisely that dogmatic version of Islam that completely prohibits any criticism of the ruler and promotes blind obedience and loyalty to the government. That's the version of Islam that bin Salman is restricting in Saudi Arabia. The very strict Wahhabi, Madkhali, Salafi version of Islam that they have had in Saudi Arabia for decades has been one that completely bars people from having political opinion or political participation or having anything to say whatsoever about or certainly not against the government. That's the version of Islam that bin Salman is trying to rein in. So again, there's just contradictions in what he's saying, which indicates that he has veered away from objective analysis and he is motivated by a personal uh, sentiment or a personal grudge or has a personal axe to grind against uh, Mohammed bin Salman or against Saudi Arabia because the contradictions are, are multiplying in his answers. The Ottoman Empire fell in the 1920s. Then we had secularism in Turkey. Then when they had their first free and fair elections, they vote Erdogan and the AK Party. And now Turkey has transformed so much in 20 years that Kilic Darulu, the opponent of Erdogan, is appealing to the conservative elements, trying to quote ayat of the Quran and trying to insist that he also believes in Allah and swearing and promising that he will not ban hijab again. That's how much, because he knows now that the liberated Turkish society leans more towards Islam. See, now he's using uh, Turkey as an example, and it's a beautiful example, 
where you had imposed secularism, like a, a very extremist secularism in Turkey. There was more or less a kind of state-enforced atheism. Uh, and the society wasn't really on board with that. And it never really uh, was manifested throughout most of Turkey. It was only in, in, in Ankara, in Istanbul, in the urban centers. But I mean, in the rural areas, not much changed since the Ottoman time, to be honest. Uh, he's saying that the population, even you know, under years of secularism, imposed secularism, the population wanted uh, was more Islamically inclined, and then they voted for the AK party of Erdogan. I mean, it's a longer story to how that all happened, but basically, yeah, they supported Erdogan, and Erdogan has been in power for many years, and Turkey has transformed, and now even the opposition that historically has been secular uh, has to uh, make concessions to Islamic sentiments in the population. Yeah. And there's no reason to believe that that won't be the case in Saudi Arabia, except that it will be. It, it may not be this very strict, rigid Wahhabi version. It may be much more in line with the Islamic sentiments of the rest of the Ummah. There's no reason to believe that the measures that Mohammed bin Salman is taking are going to somehow misguide or alienate the population from Islam. That's ridiculous because people don't follow Islam because the government tells them to. I was in Egypt 2013 covering the elections before Morsi was elected. I went from Iskenderia in the north all the way down Luxor, Ilminia and, and past it. I went to Suhag. There's a big agriculture. It's a big agriculture area. It's a city and it's an agriculture area and I'm speaking to local farmers. And I say to them, "Into Mahat Sawitul Min, who will you vote for? Nahna Al Sawitul Morsi. We will vote for Morsi. Tabli, what is it about his program, his political economic program that pleases you, etc.? The guy goes, "Listen, I don't care about no political, no economic program. Eh, na Izin, wahdi khafar Rabbina. We want somebody who fears Allah." And I said, "But surely that can't be enough. Like, you need to look at what he's going to offer you, Sami. If he fears Allah, Allah will open the heavens for him." Okay, see, he's not wrong in what he's saying here. He's not wrong in saying that there are many Muslims among the potential electorate in Muslim countries who feel this way. And that is terrifying. That's absolutely terrifying. If you think that the requirement for a politician is that he has taqwa and that's it, and you don't have to look at his policies, which is what they did with Mursi and the Ikhwan in Egypt, because they had no idea how to govern. No idea. I haven't come across any political party that is as incompetent, as naive, as gullible, and as self-confident as the Ikhwan. The level of self-confidence and self-assurance that they have is so inflated beyond their competency level, it's stunning. And yes, you had many people who thought, oh, well, Mursi, is a, he has a beard, you know, he recites Quran, he prays, Khalas, that's enough. This is a disaster. If you elect people on that basis, you will elect incompetent, and very often you will you will elect grifters who know perfectly well that the emotionally Muslim electorate doesn't know anything about politics and will just trust anyone who says, I will implement La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, whatever that means. They will support you. You'll get their money, you'll get their vote, you'll get the power. And then you will deliver your country into worse subjugation than it has ever seen. Because you have no idea how to govern. You have no idea how to protect the sovereignty of your, of your country. You have no idea what policies to implement. And very oftentimes you don't care. The Muslim Brotherhood is economically neoliberal. Not because they even understand what neoliberalism is. It's because they know that power, Western power, is economically neoliberal. And they think... If we read the script, we'll get the part. If we can read the script, we'll get the role. But what they miss is the fact that, yeah, you have to know the part. You have to be able to read the script. You have to believe in the script. You have to understand the script. And you have to be able to implement it. And you don't have the ability to implement. Because you don't even understand how government works. You don't even understand how politics works, actually, as much as you think you do. You don't actually understand. And so, no, competency does matter. And... Of course, taqwa matters, but that's not the qualification. This goes back to the 
uh, quote of uh, Muhammad bin Zayed saying that the Arabs, the Muslims, don't know how to vote. They'll vote for anybody who looks religious, who just uses religious rhetoric. And that person who uses religious rhetoric could be an American agent, could be a Western agent. And whether they're a Western agent or not, if they're stupid and incompetent, they will reach the same outcome as if they were an American agent. So it doesn't ultimately matter whether or not they are literally paid by the United States, by the CAA, by the National Endowment for Democracy, or not. If they don't know how to govern, they will be governed by those who do know how to govern externally, meaning the West, meaning the United States. He's actually just validating the opinion of Mohammed bin Zayed and Mohammed bin Salman without even knowing it, which also makes me think that he must be Ikhwan because he is kind of oblivious. People, when they land in Jeddah airport now, if you notice, it's all women at the passport checkout, which I have nothing against. But what I'm asking is this, is the emancipation of women that they stamp passports in the airport. But the point is, bin Salman is doing it to make a sign so that when they land in Jeddah, the Muslims, they see the airport is no longer for them to welcome them for Umrah. The airport is now to welcome non-Muslims to come to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia, bin Salman wants to make it open for non-Muslims, not necessarily for Muslims. Just like I said, if Muhammad bin Salman does things, to bring non-Muslims to Saudi Arabia, he gets criticized for that. Why don't you just turn it around on what you just said earlier about uh, non-Muslims hearing the Qur'an in the street and that touching their heart and then becoming Muslim. Why don't you use that same thinking for non-Muslims coming to Saudi Arabia and seeing hijabi Muslimas at the uh, immigration counter and realizing immediately, oh, everything that I always thought about Muslim oppression of women was wrong. And it, it opens their mind and makes them start thinking and then they convert. Why don't you think about that as a possibility? Because it doesn't serve your agenda of saying that Mohammed bin Salman wants to close Saudi Arabia to the Muslims and open it up to non-Muslims. This is extremely biased. It's extremely biased. I'm disappointed because this, it, it started out well and then he just completely went off the rails. And I think that the way that he's doing it is, it will not be by convincing the population. For people tried over a century to convince the population to turn away from Islamic thought and from Islamic principles. Is he suggesting that state-enforced Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia, state-enforced Salafism, the state-enforced dogma of a very strict and rigid interpretation of Islam that was enforced by religious police on the streets of Saudi Arabia, that that was trying to de-Islamize and turn the people away from Islam? Because he just said that Muhammad bin Salman won't try to turn the people away from Islam because that's been tried. In Saudi Arabia, that was tried, really, was it? Have they been trying to turn the people away from Islam for the last several decades in Saudi Arabia? Really? And again, his whole argument is based on uh, conflating that particular rigid, closed, narrow version of Islam, that particular narrow version and interpretation of Islam as the correct and only interpretation of the religion, which again, he doesn't believe. So this is a disingenuous argument showing again that he just has an axe to grind. It won't be through coaxing the population. It will be through coercion and the raves and the like. And to finish on this particular point, the raves and the, and, 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 and the other concerts and nightclubs that he's implementing is merely a decoration of the prison that he intends for the Saudi citizens. It's for the Saudis to say, yes, I have no civil rights. I have no civil participation. When bin Salman's man comes to take my land and my house and he demands it as part of Vision 2030, I have no rights to resist him. I should be kicked out of my home, but I can go and party tonight in Jeddah. The government in Saudi Arabia and the governments throughout the Khalij have always been able to seize your land. They've always been able to take your land and take your property. They've always had the right to do that. They've always had the, the power to do that. They've always had the impunity to do that. They can do that in Egypt. They can do that wherever they want. That's a power that the government possesses. And when you say that bin Salman is restricting civil engagement or restricting the voice of the people with regards to uh, policy decisions in Saudi Arabia, it's as if they used to have civil engagement. It's as if they used to have a voice in policy making. The only ones, the only voices that used to have uh, a voice in policy making, whose voice is being restricted now, are the strict, dogmatic, Wahhabi, Salafi, religious institutions in, and individuals whom bin Salman correctly believes were a hindrance to the development of Saudi Arabia. 
And yes, individuals who express, as he's mentioned, in tweets or online or whatever, perhaps mild criticism or mild dissent against the government, but whom, because of people like him, the security services, the intelligence services, and bin Salman himself, have come to suspect that the mild criticism covers radical criticism, that the mild, uh, moderate dissent is just camouflage for a radical, unhinged, uh, almost takfiri criticism of the government that views the government as invalid and trying to de-Islamize as what he's saying. It's because of people like this, with all due respect, it's because of people like this who immediately approach you as objective, cool-headed, moderate, uh, analytical minds. They approach you this way. And then, during the course of the conversation, you discover, oh, he's loopy. Oh, actually, he's loopy, who doesn't care about the good of society, who just has a very ideological agenda without regard to all of the objective analytical things that he said at the beginning. That was just the Trojan horse in the conversation to draw me in to thinking this person was a logical, reasonable person who could make sense. And then further into the conversation, he launches off the rails into talking about the dark, sinister, nefarious plans of bin Salman to remove Islam from Saudi Arabia except for Mecca and Medina and to close Saudi Arabia to the Muslims and open it only to the non-Muslims and to uh, turn Saudi Arabia into a giant beach party. Okay. That's unhinged. You're not healthy. And so it's, it's precisely because of people like this, it's precisely because of uh, this transformation that can happen in the course of a conversation with someone that has made the intelligence and security services and bin Salman distrust and suspect even mild criticism. The summit was clear. We are going to challenge Saudi Arabia's leadership of the Muslim world. We're not happy with what bin Salman is doing. Bin Salman panicked to the extent that he calls Imran Khan, and he said, who's prime minister at the time, and says to him, Wallahi la ilaha illahu. If you go to this Kuala Lumpur summit, I will withdraw my investments from Pakistan and the Pakistanis who live here sending remittances, I'll kick them out and send them back to Pakistan. Imran Khan pulls out. He calls Joko Widodo, the president of Indonesia. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha illahu. If you go to Muhammad Muhammad's Kuala Lumpur summit, I will withdraw the investments that you badly need to build a new capital that you want to move from Jakarta. And I will make sure that the Indonesians who work here as maids and as servants, I'll kick them all out and they won't be able to send their remittances. Joko Widodo sends his apologies to Muhammad Muhammad. And bin Salman succeeds in quashing it. But the, but the point here is this. Bin Salman panicked when the Ummah suddenly gathered to move the center of power from Saudi Arabia to somewhere else. Every video that goes viral that exposes Muhammad bin Salman's policies, all the journalists associated with the royal court respond immediately. All the Saudi trolls and Saudi bots respond immediately. And the reason they do so is because they are scared of something. They are scared that public opinion can be channeled into something potent that threatens Muhammad bin Salman. Okay, now he just explained to you, again, why there's repression particularly online repression, that Mohammed bin Salman has to immediately uh, crush anyone who expresses dissent online because of what this brother just said. It can spread like wildfire among emotionally Muslim people. Muslims who are connected to Islam primarily by emotion, not by knowledge, not by critical thinking, not by intellect. People who don't really know very much about Islam but have an emotional connection to Islam and an emotional uh, uh, basis for their identity as Muslims. Misinformation, disinformation, manipulated information, half-truths, exaggerations, propaganda, conspiracy theories spread faster among this segment of the Muslim population than anywhere else. It's the fastest way of spreading information or misinformation is through emotional Muslims. So yeah, Mohammed bin Salman is afraid of that because this is a man who has plans. This is a man who's trying to accomplish something. And he can't deal with the kind of disruption that can be caused by everybody spewing their ideas and their opinions who don't know what they're talking about. I mean, Mohammed bin Salman, 
must feel like uh, a dad driving a car and he has a nagging complaining wife in the back seat who is telling him you know she doesn't think he's taking the right road so he gives her an iPad to play with to distract her so he can concentrate on what he's doing concentrate on getting to his destination the iPad here is the raves the iPad here is the concerts saying please let me drive I know where I'm going just be quiet okay you can think it's right or you can think it's wrong but that's the thinking here and it's validated by what this brother is saying because he's saying that it can spread like wildfire when you make an emotional Islamic appeal to people emotional Muslims will react emotional Muslims will explode in passion and sentiment not in thought not in critical analysis but in emotion and of course this is dangerous this can disrupt plans and Mohammed bin Salman clearly is a man who has plans and he's a man who has uh, very important work to do for Saudi Arabia as as he has acknowledged there's a lot of things that Mohammed bin Salman has to do to organize the Saudi economy there's a lot of things he has to do to uh, facilitate the development of Saudi Arabia there's a lot of things he has to do to uh, expand the sphere of influence of Saudi Arabia and to consolidate their power regionally and around the world so he can't tolerate noise that could disrupt uh, the implementation of those plans I don't think that that's difficult to understand as for the idea to be honest I, I, I kind of remember when this happened but I don't remember all of the details but just based on what this brother said with regards to uh, Mahathir Mohammed's uh, summit that he was going to have in Kuala Lumpur and he was going to invite uh, Imran Khan and Widodo in Indonesia the idea being to shift the center of the Muslim world's power to the east and away from Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia I'm not sure if that was the intention but let's just for the sake of argument say that that was the intention and Mohammed bin Salman wanted to shut that down well Aside from Widodo, Widodo is a, is a clever man, but he's also at the end of his term. Uh, Mahathir is obviously a very clever man, but he's not even involved in politics really anymore. Uh, Imran Khan, good man, not particularly cunning. Not partic is kind of a Morsi type. He doesn't really, uh, not that great at politics, not that great at governance. So from these people, who is the man with the plan? Mohammed bin Salman. And he's not going anywhere. He's not elected. He can't be voted out of office. This is someone who has a plan for expanding his sphere of influence and, in my opinion, uh, is pursuing a path for Saudi Arabia and for the Khalij using their massive sovereign wealth funds and political uh, savvy and their political influence even in the West and their economic influence in the West to pursue a path that will help the entire Muslim world break free from Western corporate domination and achieve genuine political and economic sovereignty. Now, he's not necessarily doing it, as I've said before, I don't believe he's doing it for the good of the Muslim world, he's doing it for Saudi Arabia. But the ramifications of that, the repercussions of that, the consequences of that will be beneficial to the Muslims around the world. It doesn't really make sense to, uh, for, for him to accept forfeiting his place and the place of Saudi Arabia and the place of the Khalij as the driver of uh, the Muslim world moving forward in the 21st century. It doesn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense to him and it doesn't make sense to me. It's a logical place. The only other place that would have uh, or that should have a central role in driving the direction of the Muslim world would be Turkey. Even though Turkey has severe economic difficulties right now, it has the geopolitical foundations that will make it always relevant, always a significant driver, always a significant power in the Muslim world. Now, Indonesia has a lot going for it as well, but like I said, it's a democratic system in Indonesia, so you never know who's going to take power. Same in Malaysia. You never know who's going to be in power next. Mahathir, 
he was gone. Dodo is going to be gone. And also Turkey, of course. We don't know if Erdogan is going to make it past the next election. Mohammed bin Salman is not elected, so he's not going anywhere. Mohammed bin Zayed is not elected. He's not going anywhere. So the stability that those leaders provide in terms of uh, being in a position to drive uh, the Muslim world forward, they have a, a much greater stability than any of the other Muslim governments around the world. Look, it's not in the interests of anybody to, si to try to sideline Saudi Arabia. It doesn't make sense. Okay, uh, I'm just going to briefly summarize what he's talking about with regards to the Iran deal. Um, it's true that China didn't broker the deal. The deal was going to happen with or without China. Saudi Arabia wanted to include China, uh, in my opinion, to send a message and to uh, help China uh, gain more of a footing in the region, which gives the region more options. With regards to the idea that uh, Saudi Arabia was somehow forced to make a deal with Iran, I don't buy that at all. And I don't buy the idea that this ultimately strengthens or empowers Iran more than Saudi Arabia. That's inaccurate. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying that you can't shave a man's head in his absence. It means if you want to have any influence on somebody, if you want to control somebody, they have to be there, and you have to be there. You have to be in the same place. Having nothing to do with Iran has hindered Saudi Arabia's ability to restrict Iranian influence. Saudi Arabia is a more powerful country than Iran. No question about it. Saudi Arabia is a much more important and a much more powerful country than Iran ever has been or ever will be. But Iran, because of the lack of any ties with Saudi Arabia, uh, has not had to consider Saudi Arabia in any of its decisions. In other words, it hasn't had to consider the interests of Saudi Arabia in any of its decisions except in a hostile way. If they have a an agreement, if they have a uh, normalization of ties, Iran has something at stake now with Saudi Arabia that they don't want to jeopardize. And in terms of Saudi Arabia suffering because of the Khashoggi murder um, and that uh, bin Salman was somehow desperate for investment, uh, FDI has been flowing into Saudi Arabia, increasing year on year since before and since the Khashoggi murder. So that's not true. America is not the only source. The West is not the only source of investment in Saudi Arabia. Many of the development projects that bin Salman has proposed and is pursuing have been connected to China from day one. They have been connected to China from the beginning. And Chinese investment in Saudi Arabia has been continuing and it wasn't stopped or it wasn't slowed by the murder of Khashoggi. He doesn't have a problem with investment. Now Saudi Arabia has perceived correctly, has perceived Iran as a threat to themselves and to the region. And that's for many reasons. They have behaved in a way that would indicate that they threaten the interests of Saudi Arabia, the interests of the UAE, the interests of the Arab Khalij. And they have been treated accordingly by the Saudis, by the Emiratis, even though the Emiratis have a close relationship with them, even though Qatar has a close relationship with them. By bringing them on board, and in terms of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, that was always he was always going to stay. He was never going to go anywhere. Anyone, anyone who, who legitimately thought that uh, Bashar al-Assad was going to get removed, uh, you were delusional. I said it 10 years ago, Bashar al-Assad is going nowhere. This isn't, this isn't something that was unpredictable. I know that it wasn't unpredictable because I predicted it, and I'm not the only one. And certainly the people who have much more information than me, who operate at the governmental level, absolutely knew that Bashar al-Assad was going nowhere. So that's not a loss. That was priced in to the uh, regional dynamics by bin Salman and by everybody else. And again, you're going to see now bin Salman has invited Hezbollah to come and meet and establish relations with them. He's established relations with Hamas. He is positioning himself to influence these organizations uh, more than Iran. So again, this is a case of you if you want to shave somebody's head, you can't do it in their absence. If you are not at the table, then you cannot steer the conversation. Because sometimes I feel as Muslims, you know, we dislike American foreign policy, so it's like we cheer Russia and China 
whereas China has made absolutely clear what it thinks of Muslims with Uyghur, and Russia has made absolutely clear what it thinks of Muslims in its bombardment of Syria and Libya. <clears throat> okay, this is tiresome. China has made it clear what it thinks of Muslims by the uh, tens of millions of Muslims who live in China who are not bothered by the government in any way and are free to practice Islam. And they have made clear their feelings about Muslims with regards to their investments in the Muslim world that are benefiting uh, millions upon millions of Muslims. Russia has made clear their position with regards to Muslims uh, in the same way that China has. Now, China has made it clear their position towards separatists. Russia has showed that they are uh, willing to support their allies against American-backed militants. The Muslim world sees that. Now, Western uh, Muslims in the West have a, 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 there's a certain degree of disconnect between Muslims in the West and Muslims in the rest of the world. Muslims in the rest of the world see Russia in a very different light and see China in a very different light than Western Muslims who are subject to Western propaganda and indoctrination through the media. Muslims in the rest of the world are generally not particularly happy about what happened in Syria overall. And they see that a very large degree of what happened in Syria was American destabilization. So most Muslims around the world don't actually blame Russia for their participation any more than they blame America for their participation in causing the destruction of Syria. And most Muslims around the world also recognize that they are benefiting from uh, economic partnerships with China and they recognize that there are millions and millions and millions of Muslims in China who are not uh, harassed and persecuted by the government and that the Uyghurs are harassed and persecuted by the government but the basis for that harassment and persecution is separatism, is the advocacy of, of separatism, which is promoted and funded by the United States. So Muslims in the West don't really have the same understanding that Muslims in the rest of the world have. Now this may be reflected in his own views, because there is a qualitative difference between an American partner in the Muslim world and a Russian or a Chinese partner. There's a qualitative difference. And Muslims who actually live in the Muslim world uh, see that and understand that. Muslims in the English-speaking part of, the, of this ummah maybe don't understand it as clearly as the rest of the ummah understands it. Okay, in the last half hour, we've reached the one hour mark, and he's talking about the relationship between Saudi Arabia and America. And at least at the point that I'm watching now, uh, I agree with him that there is a wrong perception among many Muslims that uh, Saudi Arabia is a stooge of the United States and always has been. Just because you see that they have sometimes coinciding interests. So when you see that a comparatively weaker power is taking the same stance as a comparatively greater power, you imagine that the weaker power is just doing it out of acquiescence to the greater power. Not necessarily. It could just be, and it is has often been the case with Saudi Arabia, that this just happens to be that their interests coincide. It just happens to be that what was in the interests of America in this particular situation also was in the interests of Saudi Arabia. It wasn't that Saudi Arabia was taking this position specifically because they wanted to appease uh, and acquiesce to the West. It was because it was in their interests. And uh, I think that's that's accurate. And I think that he's correct in saying that Muslims have generally taken a very simplistic and unfair view of the relationship between Saudi Arabia and America. Yeah, now, what he's saying about uh, Saddam and uh, Saudi's uh, cooperation with the United States against Saddam is accurate. I remember when Saddam invaded Kuwait, there was a joke that was going around in the Arab world that Saddam had held a press conference and said that he was going to, uh, you know, they were asking him, okay, you've taken now Kuwait, what's next? Yeah, are you going to, he said, I'll take Bahrain, it will take me uh, a week. You'll take uh, Emirat, it will take uh, three days. And I asked him about Qatar and he said, uh, I'll take Qatar by fax. So there was definitely a sentiment among the Khalij that Saddam had crossed the line. 
and posed a threat to their own uh, governments. And so they aligned with the West against Saddam, which again is not a new phenomenon. I mean, you had, you had during the time of the Crusades, you had Arab tribes, uh, provincial leaders who would align with the Crusaders against rival tribes, rival provincial leaders, uh, because they didn't really see that the Crusaders were going to stay. And they thought, well, while they're here, I may as well use them against my enemy. And this way of thinking has continued. And you see, it's not just among Arabs. I mean, everybody does that in Africa, in Latin America, in uh, Asia, where they, because you, this is your community. These are your people. These are your rivals. And then somebody comes in from outside bringing a bunch of guns and you say, okay, uh, can you go after my enemy over there? Because you're not thinking that he's going to take over everything. You're thinking, well, I can use this person, or I can use this group, or I can use these people, I can use this army against my enemy, and then they'll leave, and then I will take over and inherit what was uh, taken from my enemy. This is a normal human uh, phenomenon, I think. Uh, when, and it, the same thing happened with colonialism, with imperialism. This is an old story. He's saying now that the relationship between America and Saudi Arabia has had ups and downs, and now it's in a down period. This analysis in my opinion, lacks uh, an awareness that the world, global power dynamics, are undergoing a transition. That the post-World War II era is coming to an end and is being dismantled. The system of the post-World War II era is being dismantled. And uh, global power dynamics are shifting. Global power dynamics have fundamentally changed over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And the direction that the world is moving is different than it was before. So it's not that, I mean, he's acting as if the status quo of America in the Khalij and in the Middle East uh, is ongoing. It's not. The situation globally is changing. It's going through a shift. It's going through a transition. And I think that Mohammed bin Salman recognizes that. And so we're not just talking about uh, this is an up or down period in the ongoing relationship between America and Saudi Arabia. The relationship is changing because America's relationship with the world is changing and America is changing because power dynamics in the world have changed to where, as I've talked about many times, the unipolar power in the world is in the private sector. It's private sector power now. And private sector power is anational, meaning it has no nationality. It's anational, like amoral. Uh, it doesn't belong to any particular country and it doesn't have any loyalty to any particular country. So this creates opportunities for countries like Saudi Arabia, like the UAE, like Indonesia, like Malaysia, like all of the Muslim world. It creates opportunities as well as risks. But the point is, the West is in decline in terms of its importance. It's declining in importance. Europe is declining in importance. Uh, the importance of maintaining specifically American primacy is also declining. America will continue to be important as an instrument of private sector power, but it's not as much in the interests of private sector power to maintain American, specifically American dominance over the world. And I don't think he's factoring that uh, global transition into his analysis. Then I'm going to cancel plans for normalization with Israel because Netanyahu promised me that he would be able to fix my relation with you. He promised me that he would get Congress and White House and he hasn't. Netanyahu, you promised. You didn't fulfill your promise, so I'm not going to normalize. Okay, now, uh, with regards to uh, potential Saudi normalization with Israel and UAE normalization with Israel, the Abraham Accords, I think that his reading of it is completely off. Uh, he is suggesting that Saudi Arabia is interested in normalization with Israel so that they can repair their relationship with the United States. And so, and, and the, the UAE uh, agreed to normalization with Israel so that they could have influence in the United States. And they have benefited uh, tremendously uh, by, by their normalization with Israel that it has given them influence in the United States. The idea that Saudi Arabia needs Netanyahu in order for them to gain influence in Washington is patently absurd. Saudi Arabia has always had enormous influence in Washington. 
the UAE has always had enormous influence in Washington, at least for the last 15, 20 years, uh, increasing year on year. The UAE had enormous influence in Washington prior to the uh, Abraham Accords. That's not something that they need Israel to deliver to them. I think that this brother is is suffering under the um, presumption that many of our Arab brothers are suffering under, which is that Israel has inordinate influence in Washington and that it is the key to power. The Saudis and the Emiratis cracked the code within the last 10, 15 years, uh, Saudi Arabia a little bit later than the UAE, realizing that the key to power in Washington is money. It's just money. That's it. And they have a lot more money to spend than Israel. And the influence of Israel in Washington is not anywhere near what people think it is. American policy towards Israel has been dictated not by the Israeli lobby, but by more by uh, the defense industry lobbies, the IT industry lobbies. And America's support for Israel for the last 50 years has been what it is because it makes sense for America. Simple. It's a compare. I mean, we talk about how much money they give to Israel, but it's a comparatively small investment relative to the return on that investment. So it it makes sense for America to support Israel, or has typically. That is declining now, and one of the reasons it's declining is because of normalization. The normalization of relations between the Arab world and Israel will significantly decrease the importance of Israel to the United States the function of Israel to the United States will be greatly diminished by normalization of relations. So I think that he's completely wrong in thinking that Saudi Arabia was depending on Netanyahu to buy them influence or to gain them access to the White House. When Biden uh, says anything derogatory about Saudi Arabia or any other country, uh, everyone understands that what that is is him asking for a bribe. That's what that is. That's old-fashioned Irish politics. You denigrate the person that you want to pay you not to denigrate them. It's, it's that simple. And someone of Mohammed bin Salman's savvy will certainly understand that. And as I've talked about before on this channel, the combined spending of Saudi Arabia and the UAE in political lobbying, campaign donations, and money spent basically to buy influence in Washington is more than is spent by China. And it absolutely eclipses anything spent by the Israeli lobby. So it's not actually accurate at all to say that Saudi Arabia was desperate to find some way to have influence in Washington. They've been having influence in Washington. And he goes on further to say that during the Trump administration, Saudi Arabia was able to get Trump to back down with regards to oil production. Sounds like influence to me. Again, this is an example of uh, his analysis being compromised by many contradictions. And those contradictions, I think, are due to him having an ideological bias. It's a genius strategy. This is an example of Bin Salman really demonstrating statesmanship. And this really pains me to say it as given what he's doing in Saudi Arabia, but strictly amoral politics it's an excellent display of Saudi autonomy and putting Biden in a position where he can't do anything about it. Okay, now I'm happy to hear him say that bin Salman uh, is pursuing a genius strategy because he is. Uh, and I've been saying that now for months. Um, I have a problem with him uh, taking exception to the strategy by calling it amoral. Because... As I talked about in a previous video, if your ultimate outcome, if the ultimate objective is a moral objective and a good objective that will benefit your people and other people, then what you have to do to achieve that objective is by definition moral in terms of what it achieves. So if he feels, if Mohammed bin Salman feels and he should, and I, and, and I believe he does, and I believe he's correct to feel this, that he has to limit the influence of rigid, dogmatic, uh, Wahhabi, Salafi institutions and individuals in Saudi Arabia in order to achieve uh, greater long-term objectives, 
then there's nothing wrong with him doing that because it's a good thing and it will benefit Saudi Arabia and it will benefit the Muslims overall. And the truth of the matter is that that particular dogma is damaging and it has been damaging and it has caused a lot of problems for the Muslim world for decades. So I don't agree with him that this is de-Islamization of Saudi Arabia. I don't agree with him that it is amoral. I don't agree with him that it is nefarious and dark and insidious and diabolical and all of these other things that he wants to portray it as. I think that it is practical. I think it's real politic. And I think it's correct. And I think that it will achieve ultimate good positive outcomes for the Muslims, for Saudi Arabia and for the Ummah overall. Uh, that's it. The last five minutes are pretty good. The last five minutes are fairly hopeful. I, I think there's still some flaws in his analysis. While this is a very interesting and valuable interview, and I think that you, everyone should watch it, uh, and you can probably learn some things because he does have a lot of information, but it is a little bit handicapped by uh, the speaker's own bias and ideological agenda. So that's it. Jazakum Allahu khairan wa assalamu alaikum.